uh, good evening. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to have all of you with us today for this very interesting uh, webinar. Uh, again, a very restricted audience when we actually do it as a webinar. A very special set of guests are joining in today uh, for this thinkers uh, dialogue. And we have a very, very special guest today, uh, Paranjoy Guha Thakurta. Uh, in fact, uh, I'm sure all of you know about him uh, for his writings, for what he has done over the years, uh, for, of course, getting embedded in controversies at points in time. Uh, in many interesting ways, uh, but then the most important of all that he's one of the most prolific authors and one of the most sharp, sharp, one of the sharpest minds that I've ever met in my life. I've known Paranjay for about uh, a decade and a half uh, as an individual following his work, uh, meeting him once in a while. Uh, but I think uh, it's just been a great experience of really learning from him in terms of like how he looks at things. Of course, there could be chances that we might disagree with a certain points of view, but that's again, part of the academic way of looking at things and so on and so forth. Uh, but beyond that, if you really look at uh, Paranjay, uh, he's somebody who's been a journalist uh, throughout his career. He started his career in 1977, uh, worked with some amazing sets of enterprises. He's worked with Business Today, uh, sorry, Business India, Business World, Telegraph, India Today, The Pioneer, and now uh, and has authored something like 18 books. No, 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 uh, no, 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 no. I have authored, authored seven books. Yeah, seven books, and he has published 25 books. I published books. 25 of them. Correct, yes, that's correct, Amit. Okay. Yes, that, that's the uh, thing. And then, of course, uh, uh, he's also been the editor for one of the finest, for one of the finest journals in the country, uh, which is Economic and Political Weekly. But again, a very short stint uh, that was there for about 15 odd months. Uh, and I think uh, the journal does miss him for his uh, views and his uh, sharp. Uh, take on situations that happen across the world. Uh, but Paranjay, thanks a lot for joining us today. It's an honor and a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you so much, Amit. Uh, it's my honor and my privilege that you uh, invited me as part of uh, the Thinker's Dialogue, and it's my honor and my privilege. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, you know, like today we are going to be talking to Paranjay about uh, the challenges of democracy or how democracies are changing across the world. Uh, this is an area wherein he has worked uh, for many, many years. Uh, he has been uh, looking at things across the world. Uh, so if you really look at uh, the things uh, that are happening across the world, Paranjay, uh, what do you think is happening? How, what is the kind of problems that we are facing? What are the challenges that democracies are facing across the world? And then I think there's also been a very interesting turning point in India in the last uh, one week. Uh, of course, if you really look at it, how the pandemic has swelled, there are challenges to the pandemic, to how Mamta Banerjee has got re-elected in Bengal. Uh, there are opportunities, there are challenges thereof as well. Uh, but there's a larger, in the larger scheme of things, there's something very profound that is happening across the world. Uh, what are your views as to what is really happening around us? Uh, over to now, you. Now, that's you. You the topic of uh, this dialogue. You said challenges, the challenges of democracy. That that's like a huge subject and uh, very honestly you, you know this word democracy which is a word of Greek origin in English alone democracy has been sought to be defined in no less than 2200 times so it's it's one of those words which certainly means different things to different people at different points of time now we in India have taken, uh, we've really emulated what we describe as the Westminster style of parliamentary democracy, which has its advantages and disadvantages about which I'll come to a little later. But by and large, when you talk about democracy, and when you talk about representative democracy, it's, it's characterized by three or four Three, actually, principal characteristics. Point one, legal equality. Two, rule of law. Three, political freedom. Now, it must be understood that in democracies, the will of the majority is supposed to prevail. But by saying that the will of the majority should prevail, it does not mean that you completely ignore or suppress the will, the wishes, the aspirations of minorities. So that's the difference between majority and the word majoritarianism. 
which acquires a considerable significance in the Indian context, as I will explain in a short while from now. Uh, what is happening is, you know, in November 1947, a gentleman called Winston Churchill, uh, he had lost power. India had become uh, politically independent at that point in time. In the House of Commons, he's famously remarked, but remember, it's not he who said it, because he also said, it is said. What did he say? Democracy is the worst form of governance, except for all others. It's an infamous statement and it can be interpreted in a thousand and one ways. But I want to hear briefly talk about why what we see across the world and also in India, a certain disenchantment with what you might call the liberal notions or the liberal consensus of what was supposed to be democracy. And then this perhaps is uh, most uh, is epitomized by the rise of Donald Trump in the United States of America. Joseph Stiglitz, the well-known economist, talk about, talked about the malcontents of globalization. And he says that the supporters of Trump are among the those who are the malcontents of globalization. Now, what is very interesting to note is that, and, and this is really the unusual part about what is happening, is that Trump is not alone. You find a right-wing demagogues, and I'll explain what demagogues mean in a short while from now. Demagogues coming to power and remaining in power for long periods of time in different parts of the world. So it's not just Trump, Trump in the United States. It's Erdogan in Turkey. It's Duterte in the Philippines. It's Putin in Russia. It's Bolsonaro in Brazil. It's Orban in Hungary. Some would say Boris Johnson is part of that group. And certainly Narendra Modi, the prime minister of India, would come into that category. Now, what is similar and different. Demagoguery, what is demagoguery? A demagogue is typically a political leader who seeks support, political support, not necessarily on the basis of facts or analysis based on facts, but emotional appeals. Appeals that often, you know, raise deep suspicions, conjures, enemies, even when they are none. But over the last several decades, what we've seen as those who have been economically marginalized have, been, have had a very, very deep suspicion of liberals and look on them as elitist, as unconcerned, and unconcerned about the fate and the aspirations of the working poor. Now, America is a, is, is a difference because you have a billionaire businessman who is representing the disenchanted poor and the working class and the less educated sections. I mean, I doubt if it will ever happen in India that Mr. Mukesh Ambani or Mr. Gautam Adani would, would get the kind of political power or aspire for the kind of political power that Mr. Trump has. But I'm going to come to that a little later. But the whole idea is a demagogue is always able to create a bogey. Mexicans are taking away your jobs. We need a wall, right? The East Europeans, the North Africans are taking away your jobs. Be careful. Watch out. So always all charismatic right-wing leaders, including all the names I mentioned, like whether it be Trump or Modi or Erdogan, Duterte, Putin, Bolsonaro, Orban, excuse my bad pronunciation, they all play on fears and insecurities. Now let's look at India because that's a subject I understand a little bit more than others. What we see in India is that the Westminster style of parliamentary democracy, which is essentially first past the post, it reduces elections to binaries, us and them, Modi, Banam, Rahul Gandhi, Mayor Banam Tu. Now, what is very unique, and this is a phenomenon that we've really seen uh, 
it's barely four, four uh, barely seven years old. You know, the first term of the Narendra Modi government and the, and the two years thereafter. And that is, if you're not with me, you're against me. And therefore, you're a spoiler. And people are voting along those lines. If you don't vote for the winner, then you're wasting your vote. Now, the first past the post system reduces elections to binaries. And at the same time, what we are also seeing, in a sense, perhaps you could argue that India is seeing the best of or the worst of both worlds, because the American system is winner takes all. So it's first past the post, winner takes all. And why is India getting the best of or the worst of both worlds? Let me explain. In 2014, the Bharti Janata Party on its own got roughly 31% of the vote. Roughly two thirds of those eligible to vote voted. The National Democratic Alliance got roughly 37% of the vote. Five years later, in 2019, the vote share of the Bharatiya Janata Party went up to about 37%. The vote share of the NDA went up to roughly 45%. The number of people eligible to vote the vote went up above two thirds. Not as high as 70%, a little below 70%. Now, yet what is happening, I mean, you could argue that more than half, 55% of those eligible to vote and those who actually voted didn't vote for either the Bharti Janata Party or the NDA, a partner. But we've seen this amazing rise of the BJP in recent times. In the Lok Sabha, which has 543 members, the Bharti Janata Party moved from two in 1984 to 138 in 2004. And then uh, sorry, I, I, it went from 2 to 182 in 1999, then slipped to 138, and then went up. And then there was no looking back. The Congress, from 404 out of 543 in 1984, slipped to 112 in 1999, went up to 145, and today, is less than 10% of the members of the lower house of parliament. So it is not even eligible to call itself the opposition party. The, the, the Adhir Ranjan Chaudhary cannot call himself the leader of the opposition. He is a leader of the single largest party in opposition. The Congress has declined to a level never before. Now, how did this happen is another issue that we can discuss. If somebody wants to ask me questions, I will answer. But you see, why does the first past the post winner takes all system reduce elections to binaries? Because in when you have a proportionate representation system, like you have in France or Germany or Canada in other parts of the world, then it doesn't matter. The number of representatives in the legislative assemblies or parliaments or legislative councils match or, or there are combinations and they match the number of votes they get. But in India's first past the post system, winner takes all, we do not have this situation. Now, in what way is India unique? India is unique because of its sheer diversity, its sheer heterogeneity. There is no country in the world with 17 languages on its currency note. There is no country in the world with 21 languages in the eighth schedule of the Constitution of India, which can be used for official purposes. And mind you, that doesn't include the language I'm speaking in at present, that is English. So what we have actually is a unique country in terms of language, caste, ethnicity, class, religion. It's a, that makes Indian politics extremely complex. And, and unlike any other country, this is what makes India truly unique. Now, when you look at anti-incumbency, again, it's a difficult phrase. I mean, if you look at the period between 1989 and 2009, 40% of the members of parliament were not re-elected. But what happened really is that the period between 1989 all the way up to 2014, India went through an era of coalition politics where no one party had a majority. That changed in 2014. And Mr. Modi was in more ways than one able to convert India's 
multi-party democracy into a two-person two political contest, American presidential election time. Now, what is what are the, uh, and, and let me quick see, and since I've been talking quite a lot, and I, I'll be happy to take all the questions, let me quickly come to the 2nd of May. And before that, I'll, I'll use, get back to a little bit of the chronology. Not in the way uh, Honorable Home Minister Amit Shah, you remember in the context of the Citizenship Amendment Act and the National Register of Citizens, he said, chronology samji, samja, chronology samji, samjai, no, samji. Understand chronology. I'm just talking a little bit about chronology. May 2014, Narendra Modi comes to power. First time in 30 years, a political party has a majority in the lower house of parliament. February, 2000, February 2015, the Aam Admi Party comes to power in the Delhi Assembly. October 2015, the Mahagadbandan government is formed in Bihar at a time when Nitish Kumar's Janata Dal United is part of the Rashtriya Janata Dal led by Lalu Prasad Yadav. November 2016, demonetization. A few months later, March, April, Bharti Janata Party sweeps to power in Uttar Pradesh, India's largest state, the most populous state in India. I mean, if Uttar Pradesh was, a, was, was an independent uh, country, it would have been the sixth most populous country in the world. I mean, uh, one out of six Indians live in uh, Uttar Pradesh. What happened after that? May 2018, Karnataka. The BJP loses and then the BJP wins. Yadurappa comes to power. I'm not even getting into the smaller states. What happened in Goa? What happened in Manipur? What happened in other states? I'm looking only at the big states. December 2018, Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, Vijay, the Bharti Janata Party. But the government changes in Madhya Pradesh. April, May 2019, Narendra Modi returns to power in the Lok Sabha elections in the wake of Pulwama and Balakot. December 2019, the NRC, the CAA, Shaheen Bagh. Few months later, February 2020, the Delhi elections, the Ahmadbi party wins again. Riots, Hindu Muslim riots in Northeast Delhi, just after Donald Trump or around the time Donald Trump. 24th March 2020, lockdown. The biggest migration of human beings in the history of humankind. I can, I, I can talk about this in greater detail if anybody's interested. Not even during the partition of the subcontinent in the period between 45 and 48 did we see so many people move within a nation state, within a country, as we saw from the night of the 24th of March 2020 till the end of June that year. All right. September, October 2020, the farmers' agitation. 2nd of May, Mamta Banerjee, Pinarayi Vijayan, and MK Stalin emerge as tall political leaders. What does it show? What does the 2nd of May show, and why is it important? It also shows the limitations of politics that denies the plurality and the heterogeneity of India. It also shows the limitations of money power. You can have an electoral bond system and one party can be the biggest beneficiary in the name of transparency and political funding. You actually have done the reverse, but you still haven't won the elections. A little anecdote here. I was a cub reporter in Kolkata uh, the then longest serving chief minister of India, I think he's now been overtaken soon by Naveen Patnaik, Pavan Chamling almost uh, there, uh, Gegonga Pangit. I'm talking about Jyoti Basu, uh, who came to power in 1977 in Bengal and uh, he, he demitted his office in 2000. Jyoti Basu once said, you know, if a person is standing in the middle of the road and distributing cash and distributing alcohol and distributing clothes and food, Everybody will come and take it. Why not? Does it mean that they're going to vote for that person or that party? He raised this question. I was very impressed and I said, oh, this is idealism at its best. I, I got disillusioned completely. Today, 
though the playing field is not level. Yes, they don't have the kind of money. No party has the kind of money that the Bharatiya Janata Party today have. The playing field is not level. But I feel I'm getting vindicated that money is not all. Two quick points before I conclude. I've taken a little longer than I anticipated. I think West Bengal has also, and also the other states, but West Bengal much more because there were elections held over a period of more than one month in eight rounds. Tamil Nadu with a slightly lower uh, share uh, in terms of number of seats. It all happened in one day. Tamil Nadu, 234 seats, one day, 6th of April. West Bengal, 294, uh, eight rounds. We can talk about why that happened. But more importantly, I feel, is the undermining of a constitutional authority, the Election Commission of India. I can talk about this in greater detail. Many other constitutional bodies and institutions that are responsible for uh, ensuring that democracy is healthy, there are checks and balances, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, I think the reputation of the Election Commission of India got a kind of battering it never, ever got. That's point number one. Last point, our Honorable Prime Minister's taunt, B-D-O-B-D, like a cat call. Like the left 10 years earlier, Mr. Modi and Mr. Amit Shah forgot that Mamta Banerjee is arguably the only, underline, the only political leader in this part of the world, Asia, South Asia, Southeast Asia, who's risen from the ranks and come onto the top without, without, underline without, the support of a male mentor, father, brother, lover, husband. I can name them for me. Aung San Suu Kyi, Khaleda Zia, Sheikh Hasina, Siri Mavo Bandar Naik, Benarji Bhutto, Sonia Gandhi, Jaya Lalitha, Mayavati. No. Didi is different. So I've made my uh, uh, initial remarks to tell you about the challenges of democracy, how things are changing and how things continue to change. Uh, it'll be difficult for me to predict what will happen in the next few years. I'm not an astrologer, but I'll be happy to take your question. I, I see one or two questions already. What are the three biggest weaknesses in our democratic rules? And can these be changed? Be sweeping, switching parties after elections? Yeah, sure. Uh, Mr. Manas Rath, thank you very much for your question. Very good question. I think the anti-defection law needs a complete overhaul. There are too many loopholes. That, I think, is one of our big weaknesses. I think our, one of our biggest weaknesses is the lack of transparency in political funding. And, and the electoral bonds thing has worsened it. Whether it be the way the Income Tax Act words works or does not work, whether the way the accounts of political parties are audited, the way in which the representation of the people work, uh, representation of the people act works, the way the model code of uh, conduct is in, uh, implemented or not in, in implemented, most importantly, the way, uh, uh, what, how, how the accounts happen, how the expenditure is accounted for, expenditure on candidates of political parties, uh, those standing, uh, the political parties themselves, and, and notably election campaigns. I think these need a complete overhaul. Uh, what is the third most uh, weakness that we have in our country? Our institutions have become very weak. It's not just the Election Commission of India. It's our judiciary, especially the higher judiciary. It's bodies like the Controller and Auditor General of India, the Central Vigilance Commission, the Central Bureau of Investigation, the media, of which I'm a part. I mean, I'm part of the media for 43 years. I, I think all these institutions uh, are very, very weak. Uh, and therefore, I think these are all separate issues which require longer discussion. So Mr. Manus Rath, Rath, Rath Babu, I've tried to answer these questions. Mr. Vidur Saigal has asked a question which is completely unrelated to the topic that I'm speaking on. Are not taxes undemocratic unless they're voluntary? Who likes to pay taxes? Nobody. <laughs> How are you going to have your roads? Are, you, are your children going to play in parks? We've seen today, our healthcare system completely broken. Who's going to pay for public health care if nobody pays taxes? And you think anybody would like to pay taxes? Nobody likes to pay taxes. The problem in India is not that a minuscule proportion of our population pays direct tax, income tax. 
our tax system remains regressive because a huge proportion of the taxes that are paid are paid by ordinary people. So when you, it doesn't matter if you're Mr. Ambani of your, or the man on the street, when you, when you buy an item uh, from, from your uh, a shop or a local grocer, you still pay the same amount of tax. That's regressive. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I could, uh, that's another subject maybe I can. One can run an economy without taxes. Uh, I'm not sure I, I, I know of any such economy. Mr. Vidhu Sargal, maybe you know one. I'm not aware of any, any country without taxes. In fact, sure. I would say that uh, uh, certain countries, including the Nordic, Nordic countries in Scandinavia, uh, the Scandinavian countries, Norway, Finland, uh, Sweden, Denmark, Iceland. I mean, the, the share of taxes and the proportion of GDP is very, very high, very, very high compared to many, many countries in the world. They don't call themselves socialist or communist, but the share of taxes, and, and this is all for uh, healthcare, for, for education, for drinking water, for, for, for roads, for electricity, etc. Et okay. So, Amit, Amit, Amit yeah. yes, yeah. over to you. Uh, I'm sorry, I've taken a little longer than what I anticipated. No problem at all. I, I think this has just been a very fascinating lay of the land in terms of like what you have said. But I have a couple of questions that emerged from your uh, remarks. Uh, one of the things that did hit me was the aspect of globalization, as you were really talking about. And you did actually allude to uh, Joe Stiglitz in your remarks. Uh, but then if you really look at it, like globalization has accentuated inequality. And do you think that has been one of the reasons as to our rise of inequality is one of the reasons for the rise of leaders that we actually see today. Is that? Yes, I have absolutely no doubt that one of the reasons for the rise of right-wing popular leaders, political leaders across the globe is on account of the rise in inequalities. And mind you, uh, earlier the, the inequalities were less between countries and more within countries. But today we see that actually happening across. I mean, there are very, very few countries in the world. I, I would possibly include the, the Nordic countries, the Scandinavian countries, where inequalities have actually not gone up. I mean, if you look at what Piketty and many others have, have found, I, I would completely agree with your view that one of the reasons is the rise of inequality, the rise of inequalities of income as well. Uh, uh, yes, uh, Mr. Vidur Saigal wants to send you a paper about running an economy without taxes. I have no problem in trying to read that economy. Uh, if you, uh, sorry, your paper, uh, maybe it might be a better idea to send it to Ms. Nirmala Sitharaman as well. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I'm, I'm not a decision maker, but yeah, I mean, if you want me to, you're welcome to uh, send me uh, your paper. It is Paranjoy, P-A-R-A-N-J-O-Y at gmail.com. Uh, remember, my email account is often looked into. So if you want it confidential, then I'll have to give you a different email. Perfect, Paranjoy. So these are interesting things, but I have to get back to one more point that you said, you know, like when you're talking about change in, in democracies or how people are getting elected or what are the kind of parameters on which they're really trying to fight the elections, two or three things really come to mind. Like one is that whole, that our borders are not secure. We are actually going to get some kind of challenges from the border. The second one is in terms of saying, oh, uh, there is immigration as a view. In fact, if you really look at what has happened in Britain, it was all driven through immigration. That immigration Brexit. The entire Brexit, the pro-Brexit, uh, within the pro-Brexit section of the population of Great Britain. Oh, sorry, Little England. It used to be Great Britain. It used to rule one third of the world. But one of the reasons uh, is, is because of exactly what you're saying. The, the, the antipathy, the antagonism towards immigrants, especially immigrants uh, and this is true for Europe also, and not just in the United Kingdom, but you're, uh, in the case of uh, you're, uh, in the case of UK, it's from East Europe. In other parts of Europe, uh, it, it's like North Africa as well. Yes. Uh, uh, before you continue, Amit, uh, Mr. Vidur Saigal, you've got my email right. Absolutely correct. Uh, and you're welcome to write to me. Uh, and uh, Mr. Manus Rath has made a very, very important point. Uh, uh, and I'll just read it out to you. It said, is it simply increasing 
inequality or the perception and reality that inequality is rising because systems are rigged in favor of those with wealth and power. So is it inequality or injustice? What is the real reason? The solution in each case is different, right? No, I'm not so sure. I, I think I can conflate both injustice and inequality. How do you explain, for instance, that when India for the first time in recent memory gets into a technical recession in the first half of uh, the previous financial year. I mean, we are looking at the period between April, May, June, July, August. And, and I use the word technical recession. Why? Because we are, we are going by the American definition of, uh, of, of, uh, of uh, recession, which is negative growth in two successive quarters. But uh, I, I see it very differently. And I very honestly, I don't believe a lot of what the government tells us in terms of statistics. I believe those statistics don't tell us the full story. Be that as it may, if the system is such, if the system is rigged towards cronies, crony capitalists, if the system, if their regulatory capture, if the system benefits uh, the, the, those who are able to gain the system and, and, and uh, those who are uh, the, the oligarchs, if you like, then that's bound to happen. So, so you have a, a situation where you have recession in the economy, but the wealth of the richest persons in India are growing. In the case of some, it's growing faster than anybody else in the world. How can that happen? Now, again, we can quibble about how do you want to calculate wealth, you know, uh, uh, the, the share price and market cap and all that. We can get into that, but this is not me. This is what Bloomberg is saying. This is what Forbes is saying. This is what Fortune is saying. This is, so I, in my opinion, if the system is rigged, then, Injustice and inequality get conflated. The solution in each case is different. Of course, it is different, but they're linked again. You can't say that you can separate the two. If you say your regulatory authorities should provide a level playing field, then that's it. You can't have a system where the regulatory authority is not fair. Okay, then it's not, then you're not in a democracy. Then, then you are in an autocracy. And as people are arguing, India is in an electoral autocracy. But the short point is, until and unless these institutions are impartial, balanced, and just, and not only just, seem to be just, you're going to have the kind of inequality. Yes. Yeah, so Paranjay, just moving ahead, you know, like one more point uh, which, which stands out and, uh, and that is about like how these uh, leaders, the new age leaders, like that we are seeing, like Ergodan, Putin, or whatever, they've been able to sell this idea of a mythical past that you, you were just great countries or whatever, make America great again. We will actually go to that full mythical past. What has driven that thinking? Like how are people falling in for this kind of a thing? Because if you really look at it, like uh, making America great again, as I see it, like America, what is the greatness of America that you're really talking about? Or what is it that you're talking about in Britain or the other sets of countries? Now, how do people get encapsulated with this kind of thinking? Or how do they really get fixated with this imagination? Very, very good and perceptive question that you've asked me, Amit. This is indeed the key, the key ingredient. I can, I mean, excuse all the birds chirping in my, in my balcony. That's good ambient noise because it's all around me. There's been death and devastation. Uh, there have been illnesses and deaths in my own family as well. Even as I talk, I'm a very, very dear mem a member of my family is down with COVID. That's not the point I want to make. I'm going beyond the personal. Uh, you know, when you look at how demagoguery works, a very, very, very important element is as you promise a very bright future, make America great again, you are also harking back to a mythical past where you are conflating myth with history. So, it, you know, and, and, and in the belief that before elections and after elections, people will be taken in by those promises. Ha, agar har 
तो हर गरीब परिवार को आपको पंद्रह लाख रुपया मिल जाता ओके वेट इट जस्ट गोज ऑन एंड ऑन लाइक दैट डीमोनेटाइजेशन what is it 84% of the currency in circulation was suddenly taken away and you said it hurt the rich it removed i mean it it it, it black money was was i mean those generators of black money were they were badly impacted what are you also saying we are going to stop funding uh, to the terrorists we are going to stop all that happening we are going to stop i mean every single official statement that was made by the government by my college mate chakrikant das who was then in the ministry of finance with dr urjit patel who was then the governor of zambia go back to those statements none of those the, the reasons for demonetization happened but you conjured a myth that this is going to this is going to hurt the rich aur aap aapko to bahut der tak dukh bojhna padta hai और कुछ दिन आप प्रायश्चित कीजिए स्टे अल लॉन्गर सो आई सी वेदर इट्स एब्सोल्युटली फॉल्स और इट्स कंप्लीटली इन द रेलम ऑफ इमेजिनेशन प्लास्टिक सर्जरी एंड गणेश ओवर एवर द होल आइडिया इज टू कंजर अ मिथिकल पास टू विच यू आर गोइंग टू वेन थिंग्स वर बेटर But, but the, you know, as far as the Indian context is concerned, I'll be very straight. How can you have? Okay, you have a Congress Mukh Bharat. Yes, we're already there. But if you have an op- opposition Mukh Bharat, can you have a democracy? You can't. Okay, you have one nation, one election, one nation, one market. How come if you want one nation, one election, you had West Bengal eight rounds of elections? so you know uh, i'm being very circumspect in the way i'm talking but i think all of you here are listening to me i'm proud and privileged that you're listening to me you're getting the message now i can't predict the future and honestly i i uh, you know what happened in 2019 pulwama balakot i never thought mr modi and the bharatiya janata party would emerge stronger i was wrong my political instincts i didn't were wrong in bengal i thought it would be a far closer context a contest between the bharatiya janata party and and the trinamool congress it turned out to be a clean sweep something that you, you know the ordinary voter always the the, the 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 people of this country we always underestimate their sagacity their intelligence their wisdom uh and uh, so i mean this gets proved every now and then I mean, Pinarayi Vijayan in Kerala. He's done something which has not happened in forty years. Every, four, I mean, in the last forty years, on every occasion, we've seen the the uh, the coalition in power change, and suddenly it has not happened. In Tamil Nadu, it's a different story altogether. In Assam, it's a different story altogether. But yeah. so we are seeing very very interesting developments acha there is another q and a right here uh, uh, mr manas rath once again can we avoid a comparison with the political governance system of china uh, what can we learn from there what can uh, strengthen democracy in india and other countries you know this is a subject of a separate discussion altogether okay let's let, let let's look at the similarities and let's look at the differences yeah we are two that we are the two largest or the two most populous countries in the world india and people's republic of china between india and china you have about 40% of the population of the planet china has a single party rule from 1951 52 onwards we had elections at least once every 5 years uh, the indira gandhi's emergency was an aberration the period when we had uh, coalition governments was also you could call it an aberration for the first time in 1996 you had four prime ministers within one calendar year but by and large we've had elections on a regular basis what do we learn what do we not learn political democracy economic progress your notion of economic progress okay i have spoken to people from china and they say yeah we i said are you you call yourself a communist country are you communist 
And then he joked and he laughed and he gave me a very facetious reply. You know, we are politically communist and economically capitalist. <laughs> Come on. I mean, we, we can discuss this on, a, on, a, on, a, on another occasion because it's, a, it's not a simple subject. It's a complicated subject. All I want to know, uh, all I want to say is that something, uh, I mean, we need to learn, we need to unlearn everything. We need to learn from what is happening before everything, uh, everybody in the world, you know? You want to be Vishwa Guru? What's your healthcare system today? It's in tatters, it's broken, death and devastation all around you. You want to be a Vishwa Guru? You want to be the pharmacy of the world? You don't like China, you're fighting against China? More than 70% of your active pharmaceutical ingredients are still being imported from there. Just one, one example I'm giving you. And, and yeah, politics and economics. Do they merge? Of course they merge. Can they be separated? How can they be separated? In the short run, in the long run? These are complex questions and not easy questions to answer. And in my opinion, Mr. Manasrat, this requires a far, far more detailed discussion. Mr. Pavan Agarwal, why are you so negative? I'm being realistic. I'm being realistic, Mr. Alarwal. I would love to be optimistic. Ask the people who've seen their family members pass away for lack of a hospital bed, for lack of oxygen. You want to know how I got my second dose of vaccination? Why am I being negative? No. I'm being realistic. We were told the crisis was over. I didn't say this. I didn't ask Mr. Narendra Modi to say it. I think I'm being realistic. I am an eternal optimist, but I cannot be cocoon myself and shut myself away from the reality around me. So Mr. Pavan Agarwal, I beg your pardon. I never promised you a rose garden. I think I'm being very, very realistic. So, you, you know, like on this note, uh, uh, Paranjay, I just want to ask you one thing. Like when you talk about the rise of the BJP, of course, that's a will of the people in many, many ways. Like, of course, uh, in spite of what you were saying, it's majority, majoritarianism or whatever, but there is a certain will of the way, will of people as to how things are happening. How do you negate that aspect? Like, how do we really say that uh, there is something wrong? Because we have a system that has actually worked in the past, and that system has actually been used uh, by somebody else as well. So, how do you really look at uh, this aspect of how we really function as a okay? Uh, mm -hmm. My problem is in precisely the two words that you mentioned: majority and majoritarianism. Okay, let's look at religion in this country. Roughly 80% of the population of this country, about 1.35 or 36 billion, 135 crore people, are, say they're Hindus, right? Right, wrong, whatever. But one out of seven Indians is Muslim. What does this mean? That there are more Muslims in India than in any other country in the world, with the exception of one country, and that is Indonesia. And, and I bring this uh, up because it's a question of Bengal. Can you demonize one seventh of the population? Mr. Trump, could he demonize African Americans? Could he demonize Hispanics? Could he demonize Mexicans? I think as soon as you start demonizing a large section of the population, you run into huge problems. And that's the difference between having a majority and having a majoritarian view of governance, which is autocratic. Now, the Rashtriya Swamsevak Sangh, which is the ideological parent of the Bharti Janta Party, they believe in a Hindu Rashtra, okay? They do not, I, mean, I I have met many of them, and they do not think that Indira Gandhi uh, did the right thing by inserting two words in the preamble to the Constitution of India, and that's the word secular and the word socialist. These are words that are loaded, that mean different things to different people. Be that as it may, the point that has to be noted 
is that, and I go back to the point I mentioned, if the brute force of the majority is to always prevail, then you're going to have no minorities. Then minorities have to say that we are a second class citizen. You know, this, is in, this was in my uh, opinion, the problem with the Citizenship Amendment Act. And I, I dare say this was the first attempt to have an amendment to a law on the basis of religion. Now you can say, because the Bharatiya Janata Party has a majority in the Lok Sabha, therefore, they can change the act. Of course they change the act. But the point is different. The point is different, and that is, why didn't the BJP bring up the CAA and the NRC in the run-up to the election campaign in Assam and Bengal? This is the question. So what the Mexican to Trump is the Bangladeshi for the BJP. Now, in my opinion, it's very, very significant. And therefore, the message that comes out from Bengal is very, very important. You must remember that Jammu and Kashmir, while it was still a state, <coughs> it was the only Muslim majority state in India. And Jammu and Kashmir is no longer a state of India. It's a, a, a union territory. But among the major states in India, West Bengal has the highest proportion of the population, which is Muslim. It is the highest, not among them. It is the highest. It's roughly 27%. Now, what is very clear to me is that in Bengal, almost no Muslim voted for the Bharatiya Janata Party. But why did the BJP not do as well? Amit Shah said, we are going to get 200 seats. They got less than 100. Why? It's because it was not just the Muslims that their vote got con consolidated behind the Trinamool Congress. It was a substantial section of the Hindus who also voted with the TMC. So when you look at religion and when you bring religion into politics, it has different impacts on different people. And, and my, uh, this is my uh, long answer to your short question, Amit, about uh, the importance of religion or the unimportance of religion in a country like ours. We are a multicultural country. Let's accept that. I mean, Christianity came to Kerala before it went, went to West Asia or the Middle East, as the British would call them. I mean, I mean, the, the, these are facts I'm giving you. I mean, is Hinduism a religion? Is it a philosophy? Uh, is, is it many, many different ways of looking at it? So uh, uh, I, I am of the view that when politics and religion, when, when the state, the government, starts discriminating among citizens on the basis of religion, this is not good. It's terrible, in my opinion. And, and even though the Bharatiya Janata Party will never say so, Mr. Modi will never say so, Mr. Amit Shah will never say so, Mr. Mohan Bhagwat will never say so, what is he actually seeing on the ground is something else. The diffraf, the fringe elements. And, and the attempt to communalize it is, in my opinion, one of the saddest things that have happened to India in the last few years. Okay, one second. Yes. I, I, I see a, a whole lot of questions have come which I had not seen. Okay, Mr. Prabhat Lab. How can you, can you comment on how crony capitalism has also contributed to the undermining of democracy in India? All right, uh, I'm going to answer you. Uh, electoral reforms. I've already answered that question. Can the people in power favor a person or a group and say it is the will of the majority, hence it's democracy? I've argued Mr. Vijay Rai right through that it's not, not the case. Uh, when people of the country prefer the fulfillment of their religious ap as aspirations over everything else, including their own health and well-being, then whom do you blame for undermining the democracy, the people or the political parties? Good question, Mr. Prabhat Lal. Uh, I agree with you. I have actually nothing to comment on what you're saying. I mean, you have made a comment and I, I will go along entirely with you. If the people, uh, for them, their, uh, their uh, religious aspirations or their religious views are more important than their health, their economic well-being, then uh, we have nobody to blame but ourselves. Uh, Ms. Malti Mehta, I've suggested a slew of electoral reforms. I can talk to you for half an hour on the subject, but how does crony capitalism also contribute to undermine democracy? Let, let, let me try and answer this question to the best of my knowledge is the absence of a level playing field and the way political funding happens in this country. What does crony capitalism mean? 
it means that people, some people are getting an unfair advantage because of their proximity to those who are in power and authority. What is an oligarchy? An oligarchy is a, 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 a place where particular industrialists are favored, not because they deserve to be favored, but because of their proximity to those who are in positions of power. That is the hallmark. Now, we in India find there's always been crony capitalism. What are the new dimensions? And you can see some of this having come with the, the rise of Dhirubhai Ambani as India's richest man. And we see continuing it to happen. That it is not just that the government, its policies, the regulatory authorities help in the rise of a particular corporate conglomerate. But what we also see is the absence of a level playing field, the absence of competition. And this is where Amit Kapoor is your, your area of interest, the absence of competition. But what is equally important is when this happens, you're actually favoring a particular industrialist at the expense of others. So I mean, very circumspect, I can talk about this in greater detail. A particular corporate group gets control of the second largest airport in this country. In the process, somebody else has been put down. Another telecom and mobile internet service provider becomes the first in position because of a favorable regulatory regime. If the level playing field is, if the playing field is level, good. Let the consumer decide. That's good. Unfortunately, what we are seeing, uh, and crony capitalism is a dimension of this, and oligarchy is another dimension of it, we are really seeing uh, this undermining democracy. I've tried to answer your question, Mr. Prabhat Lab, to some extent. And what explains the electoral differences in center and state elections? Why does Modi's image work in the former and fail in the latter? A very good question. And here I can uh, merely quote uh, a well-known political scientist, Abhay Dubey, uh, of the Center for the Study of Developing Societies, CSDS. Abhayji, Professor Abhay, has made a very, very interesting observation. I, I interviewed him after the Bihar elections. And he said that, look, it's what he called the Sarkari Karan of Rajniti, the, the governmentalization of politics in India. So in the center and at the level of the states, those who are in power have an advantage, have a political advantage. That's his argument. Now, whether this argument will hold and how long it will hold, we'll have to wait and watch. See what happened in Bihar. The Mahagad Bandhan, everybody thought it was about to win. It lost. I mean, uh, as to twist that adage on its tail, it snatched defeat from the jaws of victory. But look what happened in the other states, you know. So it's not as simple as we always think, because the electorate will always surprise us. Orissa is the classic example. Orissa, the elections to the local assembly and the Lok Sabha. In, in April, May of 2019 were held simultaneously. Why did they, the electoral vote differently? Why did they press one button for the Lok Sabha candidate and another for the, 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 the what do you call it, the assembly? And, and as I mentioned a little while earlier, uh, we, we are about to soon see perhaps Mr. Naveen Patnaik becoming the longest serving chief minister of India. Mm, do most of the problems mentioned, mentioned by you start in 2014 or were they earlier too and the BJP stopped, didn't stop them? No, some of the endemic problems have been there for a long time. Say healthcare. This didn't happen overnight. The last few weeks has seen a complete breakdown of the healthcare system in this country. But the healthcare system was decrepit. It was in a mess. It was in a terrible mess. Now, you, you can't say it happened in 2014. This has been because as a country, we have been systematically under investing in healthcare. And unlike even the advanced capitalist countries, we have reposed our faith in private healthcare more than public healthcare, whereas it's the other way around in many, many parts of the world. So uh, 
these these could be uh, um, i mean i'm again giving a somewhat long and a somewhat rambling uh, response to some of the questions yeah. so but ranjay we're just moving ahead you know like to the points that you've made there's something very interesting as i i really look at it and i want to ask this question you know like it it might be fairly easy for us to really say that bjp has done xyz or it is right it is wrong or whatever but i think there is at some point in time we have to see that all these things or the rise that we have seen is also embedded in the historical wrongs and the perceived wrongs that have actually happened or the mistakes that what you would want to actually say is the liberals might have actually made Uh, because the continuous dialogue has always been uh, how rajiv gandhi had actually changed uh, at the shah banu case or how people were moved away from kashmir uh, or the migration that actually happened from kashmir uh, and so there there are some historical issues that that emerge and that is what people uh, what you call feel antagonist about or antagonized about uh, how do we solve that because i think okay that is an important question for us to really grapple with as right. to why the rise has actually happened because There are some mistakes that have happened in the past. You know, uh, many mistakes have happened in the past, and they were not just con- uh, committed by one party or one leader. And uh, hindsight gives us a better pers- uh, idea of what those mistakes were. But let me answer your question, and I link this to a question you asked earlier: these perceived historical wrongs. How much of it is mythology, myth? and how much of it it is fact and in this post truth world that we live in where opinion matters more than facts and this is amplified by the social media in fact i can talk for hours and hours on the social media the question is why are we so selective why i mean and here this is where i ask this government some specific questions why has mr modi in particular found more fault with pandit jawahar lal nehru india's first prime minister than in all other subsequent prime ministers in india why why is he relatively less critical of indira gandhi many people would argue that you know uh, different way differently so whether it be the shah banu case by rajiv gandhi let's not forget as i mentioned this earlier rajiv gandhi headed the a government which had the kind of majority which no government ever had 404 out of 543 and what happened 5 years later he was voted out of power 1989 december 1989 vishwanath pratap singh became the prime minister of india now i'm i'm here making a set of arguments perceived wrongs actual wrongs it's how you sell it's how you sell those messages it's how you sell those perceptions and i dare say it's how you even brainwash people okay the last census which was held in this country which was in 2011 said about one out of four persons close to one out of four persons in india could not read or write her or his name i don't think an illiterate person is a fool just as i believe a highly educated person is a good man be that as it may the point that i'm trying to make amit is that these perceptions are created for political gain as well example uh, a relative of mine once read out to me a little message that he'd got on whatsapp and he said mosa ji mosa ji मैंने पढ़ा व्हाट्सएप में हर मुसलमान आतंकवादी नहीं है मगर हर आतंकवादी मुसलमान है नॉट एवरी मुस्लिम इज अ टेररिस्ट बट एवरी टेररिस्ट इज अ मुस्लिम एंड आई एम एक्चुअली अ पॉल आई एम अ शेम्ड एट द स्प्रेड ऑफ इस्लामोफोबिया एट हाउ वाइड स्प्रेड दिस मिस मिसपरसेप्शन दिस फॉल्स हुड दिस हाफ ट्रू is prevalent among large sections of the society to which i belong i'm as patriotic as any indian all right but i am also you know i can be a patriot i can love my country and dislike my government that's a very very old saying so i can continue on and on but uh, amit 
it's 7.30. Yes. But and and uh, before we wind up, would you give me the honor and the privilege of just reading out something for your viewers? A poem that came to me uh, this morning, a poem that has been doing the rounds all over. And, and if you are in a mood, I'll be very, very delighted to read it out. Sure, please. Shall I do it now or wait? Absolutely. Absolutely. You can do it. Yeah. Okay, let me find the poem. Yes, here we go. It's been written by somebody I don't know, Nandini Sen Mehra. She's a poet and an author. And if some of your viewers, including Mr. Pavan Agarwal, thinks I'm negative, so be it. I'm reading a poem that moved me. And night has come upon my land. The carrion birds encircling and prayers ascend on fires lit. The shadows fast descending and leaders know not how to lead. They gape, they watch in silence while each new day brings grief afresh. No help, no rest, no guidance. And those who come with sturdier boats will row perhaps to safety, but most will flee in desperate need, expendable humanity. What will remain when the storm has passed, when many so loved are lost? What will be changed within our hearts? What will this time exhaust? May then we not allow ourselves to be led by those inept for want of air while many died, unmoved while many wept. May we never again be fooled by words, by power, by greed. Put not our faith in men of stone who use us for their need. And know that when the night was dark, who came to hold your hand, it was the stranger, the ones unknown who share this wounded land. It was the one you did not trust, the ones who were the other. And when the leaders had all, all had fled, in him you found a brother. Let no powers again succeed to divide us at their will. Let love remain in our battered hearts, the hope they could not kill. Nandini Sen Mehta. And those who think I'm a pessimistic, no, sir. The darkest hour is always just before the dawn. But we don't know how long that hour would be. How many days, how many years Kali Yug could go on. Thank you once again for giving me this honor and this privilege. Thank you once again, Amit. Thank you, everybody who's been listening to me. Thank you, Thank you Pranjay. It was a pleasure having you with us. Thanks a lot.